Hi, I'm Dan Rockmore, director of the Newcomb Institute for Computational Science uh, here at Dartmouth College, and on behalf of the college and the Newcomb Institute, I'd like to welcome you all to this year's Fall Donahoe Colloquium, Democracy versus Clickbait, Machine Learning, Authoritarianism, Privatization of the Public Sphere and the Future, from Professor Zeynep Tufekci of the University of North Carolina. The Donahoe Colloquium is an ongoing series of public lectures aimed at increasing awareness of the many important and sometimes surprising places in which computational ideas are shaping our lives. These events are made possible by a generous gift from David, Mickey, and Dan Donahoe in honor of Dan's graduation as a class, as a member of the class of 2006. It's a central piece of the larger mission of the Institute, whose aim is to support and integrate computational thinking and computational ideas throughout the Dartmouth community. The Institute itself is made possible through the generosity of Bill Newcomb, Dartmouth class of 64, and a former trustee of the college. A theme in many of the Donahoe colloquia is the tension that exists between the productive and pernicious potential of computational science. This tension is displayed to dramatic effect in the ever-evolving marketplace of ideas that is the public sphere. Roughly speaking, the public sphere is the social space in which political action takes place. History, modern and even not so modern, here and around the globe is at least in part a story of how developments in computational science, especially in information processing, have transformed the public sphere and in so doing laid the groundwork for both freedom and repression. Social movements of all kinds, from the Reformation to the French Revolution, from the Arab Spring to our most recent presidential election and beyond, have been shaped by the information sharing tools of the era as well as the people who make them and control their deployment. While there are many common themes in this historical arc, it's also true that the public sphere of today is very different from that of the past. Ubiquitous connectivity among participants, the compression of time and space enabled by today's technologies, and finally, the data-driven and algorithmic nature of the underlying information dynamics have produced a set of competing set of have produced a set of competing affordances and paradoxes of behavior that have made today's digital public sphere a new and singularly messy cauldron of creative action, democracy, anarchy, and oligarchy. Our speaker, Dr. Zeynep Tufekci, is one of today's most thoughtful and clear-eyed critics of this paradox-laden social space. Part sociologist, part technologist, and part activist, Dr. Tufekci brings a rare combination of deep theoretical understandings, cutting edge empirical methods, and empathy to a complex and supremely important subject. Professor Tufekci received her undergraduate degrees in sociology and computer science from Istanbul University and Bosphorus University, and her master's and PhD from the University of Texas at Austin. She's currently an associate professor at the School of Information and Library Science at the University of North Carolina and a faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. Dr. Tufekci's writing appears in a wide range of venues, academic and otherwise. She is a contributing opinion writer at the New York Times, and her first book, Twitter and Tear Gas, The Power and Fragility of Networked Protests, was published just this year by Yale University Press. I recommend it to you as one of the most thought-provoking books I've read in a long time. In 2015, Dr. Tufekci was among the select inaugural group of 32 Andrew Carnegie Fellows identified by the Carnegie Corporation as, quote, the scholars, journalists, and public intellectuals in the humanities and social sciences who are pursuing research on the challenges facing U.S. democracy and international order in the next 25 years. In light of current and ongoing events both here and around the world, such a focus of energy, attention, and intellect has perhaps never been more important. And so we are so very fortunate to have with us today one who has made such concerns her life's work, sharing her thoughts on these grave issues. Please join me in welcoming our fall Donahoe Colloquium speaker, Dr. Zeynep Tufekci. So hello, everyone. That was a very kind introduction. And he, you pronounced my last name correctly. I was telling him, Yuki, there's no downside to pronouncing it wrong because there's no grand truth. Nobody knows how it's supposed to be pronounced because it's <laughs> Turkish. Turkish is kind of an isolate language. Uh, it doesn't really, it's not really related to too many, uh, it's, at least it's not related to Indo-European languages. So I did grow up in Turkey. I was born in Istanbul and that's a big part of what shapes my um, worldview. 
I grew up under the shadow of the 1980 military coup in Turkey. You know how they say the Eskimo allegedly have many words for snow? That's kind of disputed and complicated, but I can assure you in Turkish we have many words for coup because we have many different kinds of coups. We have like very hard military coups, we have soft coups, we have postmodern coups, we have failed coups. I, I do mean this. We have coup by letter, we have coup by... So uh, I grew up under a particularly harsh version uh, that was a full military dictatorship. And this was also at a time when in Turkey we had a single television channel. And in that very single television channel, which turned on, I believe, like six or seven. It turned on sometime in the evening. It didn't even have 24-hour coverage. It would turn on, and then all of us would only have that as the only option. We would watch shows on this you know, TV channel. We would watch shows like The Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> you guys know that? Laura Ingalls in the middle of the sort of the frontier. And I was always puzzled. Where is this place? Because <laughs> see, I'm from Istanbul. Like, if you dig a little, you get the Ottomans. If you dig a little more, you get, you know, Byzantine, East Rome, or you keep digging, you hit Neolithic villages. I kid you not. They were trying to find a place to dig the subway. They finally started digging under the sea to try to avoid old archaeology, and they found Neolithic villages. There's no middle of nowhere. Whereas these people seem to be in the middle of nowhere somehow. We just try to puzzle it out. The other thing I remember uh, that we were shown is the soap opera Dallas. <laughs> that was even more confusing because they had a ranch, but they lived in a city. Like, it just didn't combine in my sort of Turkish head because in Turkey, cities are crowded. They're like, it's like if somebody had a ranch in the middle of New York, Manhattan, right? You'd make no sense. It sounded like that. They also drank a lot of whiskey. Uh, and we were like, what is going on here? The reason we watch that a lot is that the military dictatorship did not really want us to watch much else. Right? There wasn't a lot of critical culture being produced. There was a conflict in the southeast part of the country that was um, an insurgency that unfortunately has claimed 40,000 lives and still counting so many years later. Um, and you got no news of it. Like you could literally be living in a different planet in terms of your access to news because we only got all of this. And I was one of those kids who was really interested in math and science. And there's a way in which uh, kids who are into physics encounter this first ethical dilemma pretty early on. I call it the atom bomb problem. Like you start thinking, I like math, I like physics, you know, secrets of the universe, and you're thinking, what do I do with this? You imagine yourself a physicist, and then you learn, uh-oh, right? You're like seven, eight, nine, and you learn that there was, there's this thing called nuclear weapons that were made possible with the understanding physicists brought into the question you start having these ethical dilemmas in your child brain. And uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, mostly family reasons, I had to get a job pretty early. I had to live on my own very young, and I had to pay for college on my own. Um, so that was, it wasn't just an ethical dilemma for me. I had no luxury of thinking, oh, I'll just do this and do something else. I also needed to get a job as early as I could. Uh, and it started with me bagging groceries when I was 13. It was actually a good job, but I needed sort of a job that would allow me to survive in Istanbul. So I thought, let me pick a field that's still closely related to math, but that doesn't have a lot of ethical dilemmas that come with it. <laughs> so I thought, I like computers, I like programming, why not? <laughs> So this is a way of telling you guys that my young version was not good at predicting things. <laughs> right now, the ethical dilemma my physicist friends face is that when somebody gets the Nobel Prize for the Higgs boson, how many people can be on that award? <laughs> because it's actually this giant collective work, 
endeavor. They have the CERN, they have all of this, they have people building stuff, they have the experiments, they have the theoretical, and the papers have these long things. So their ethical issue is how many people are going to be on that stage? Whereas my people are building killer robots, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or changing sort of history with misinformation and all the other stuff that I'm going to talk about. So there we go. Uh, so early on, one of the things that got me interested in this is um, that kind of having to work very young had interesting twists for me. One of the things I did, I started working like my first semester in college and I quickly got, I thought I was just going to write accounting software. I literally thought, you know, I just write stock inventory. That's what people did in Turkey back then with computers. But I got a job working uh, with IBM on localizing an operating system that I don't even know if they make it anymore. But it was a sort of very narrow job. There was this machine, and it needed to be localized, the operating system compiled, all of that. It was a machine that had the, the source code was compiled on a computer that had been built before I was born. <laughs> okay, it was this mainframe that was, they were using. And uh, it was a time when, right now, Silicon Valley, they have this sort of young people who do lots of things. They had that kind of, they're used to that. Back then, someone like me working in the IBM building, that was not very appropriate because I was a teenage girl, to be honest. That's what I was. I was a teenager. I was just in college. And I, you know, fine, you're geek, but I had the same, you know, where the sandals with jeans kind of thing, whereas IBM at the time, everybody wore the ties and suits and things, and my teenage uh, young version wasn't, I, I didn't even really sort of think about it much. So what would happen would be that my immediate supervisor, my immediate boss, would come up to me in random times and she'd say, Zainab, let's go to lunch. I'd be like, it's 10.30 a.m.? She's like, let's go to lunch anyway, you know, we'll have an early lunch, I'm paying. I was like, ah! Magic words, right? <laughs> you know, there's the part about me being broke, right? So I was like, fine. And then the next day, she'd come at 3.45, and she'd say, Zainab, let's go to lunch. I'm like, you're paying? And she's like, yes, OK. So I was constantly ushered out of the building at weird hours. Well, it turns out they hadn't managed to confess to the upper management that they had hired this teenager <laughs> wearing you know, jeans and sneakers to do this big project. So whenever they were going to come down, somebody would rush and take me to lunch. Uh, and I have to say, I, I, even after I kind of figured this out, I was like, OK, let's not disrupt the scenario. <laughs> in fact, take me to breakfast and dinner, too, as long as you know, the free food part comes in. Um, but at the time, IBM also had the intranet. See, this is Turkey still. No internet. Like, internet's going to come many years later that IBM had this global intranet. And there, I could go on the internet and say, um, this machine, mainframe, that's kind of this giant thing that I'm just reading the manual, right? I'm just sort of trying to figure out. In fact, the way I managed the project was like they had these huge binders that were the manuals. And I have a way of when I'm learning a programming language, I usually start from the back because you read the glossary, all the terms, and I just sort of read backwards. And I just had read like, I don't know, 14 volumes of this thing and couldn't figure it out. So I was saying, how do I do whatever I was trying to do? And somebody would pipe up and they'd be like, oh, you know, I, I actually programmed that sub thing you know, back in 1970 something, and I'm now in Japan, but here, I'll help you, right? There were IBM employees who had built the mainframes, they had built the op operating systems, and they would help me figure out how I could work on that to be able to work on this mid-level machine that also operated on the personal computers. It was this sort of thing. So I had that sense, you know, on the one hand, I'm living in Istanbul, right? They had, I think they had moved to Dynasty on TV by then. It was the same problem, like, what are these people doing? It made no sense in the Turkish context. So we're still watching American soap operas. It's still a pretty controlled, heavy censorship environment. There's a single FM channel in the country, single FM radio. And for some reason, they had decided only to play Western music and jazz and blues. So there's a generation of people, kind of my age, who actually listen to bluegrass and stuff. 
from, it's, I'm serious, there's a giant sort of group of them because that's all you had and you learned to like it. Um, but in, as soon as I went on that forum and asked my questions, it didn't matter who I was. And I got information and I could ask anything. It was this giant resource and they're all these sort of chatting and everything. So I thought, wow, this is gonna change everything. This is amazing. And one of the things I did, and it's gonna come up with like in my final slides as a um, recommendation, is that I was always into fiction, especially science fiction, speculative fiction, which you just wrote about as a sort of a thing we need to do more about. So I always had this sort of imagination on how is this gonna play out. And all of a sudden I was living in these dual worlds, uh, censorship, Turkey, information kind of coming through this little straw. And then even IBM's little intranet was just amazing and mind blowing for me. So some of the utopian work you have from the early 90s about the internet, I don't think it was completely false. In fact, there's a lot of things that are still great about it. And I experienced some of it. It was just an amazing time to be able to connect with the world in ways that was never possible. So I thought, let me study how to, how this is gonna work. Let me just sort of go be a sociologist. And people were like, computers, sociology? This lady is crazy? Because <laughs> back then, nobody brought those things together. It was kind of like, imagine, they couldn't imagine two things further apart, probably. I mean, if you said, I'm gonna study art and chemistry, that would at least be more reasonable. Maybe you're gonna study how paint works or something. Like when you said computers and sociology, people thought those things have nothing to do with one another. So I couldn't even do like a simultaneous major. I did one, then the other, kind of, because uh, it wasn't really great doing either in Turkey. So I graduated, but I wasn't really doing what I wanted to do. I was still thinking about these things. And then the internet came to Turkey. I was like, sign me up. You know, I immediately, I was one of those people that had to have two phone lines in her house because it was a modem, so it was always tied up. I was just sort of, um, I was really, really happy because I had grown up, um, and not only is the information scarce, I, I spoke only Turkish for my childhood. I learned English uh, as a teenager. And um, like, I had a grandmother who would buy me books, and for a couple of years, I had this great luck of work, uh, going to school in the same school as her where she was a teacher. And in Turkey, we had these traveling salesmen, they were always men, who came and sold encyclopedias. Like they would come, I think they had them in the US before too, they would go door to door and they would sell the encyclopedias. And as soon as they came to the school where my grandmother was a teacher, where I was a student for those few years, they would be like, aha, uh -huh, sh there she is. They would find me. They'd be like, all right, let's go to my grandmother. And she would buy me whatever they were selling. I had every single volume of every single encyclopedia that was translated into Turkish. And that was a finite number. That was finite enough that I read them cover to cover so many times that I knew everything in them. They were small. I mean, there was not. It wasn't three volumes, but it wasn't 3,000 volumes because there was only so many translated into Turkish. And I'd be like, all right, today I'm going to read the P's again. You know, I would just pick them up by letter. <laughs> they were organized by letter. So I went from that world to all of a sudden, you know, your modem goes beep, 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 and boom, right, the world. So that was what really struck me. And then... Uh, bunch of luck and sort of coincidences. I thought, this technology is happening in the US. And I had never been to the US as an adult. I had come here as a, like before I was three, so I was four. So I had no memory of it, and I hadn't learned English either. Uh, so I thought, this is all happening in the US. Maybe I'll go to the US and study this. And I knew some people. And by luck, those people were connected to UT Austin, University of Texas, and I just applied only to that school. I had no idea how higher education in the US worked. Nothing, like I don't really have parents who helped me through any of this, and I had, like there wasn't, the internet wasn't that developed. I didn't have a frequently asked questions about US higher education, so I applied to the only school where I knew people, and I got accepted. And the school was in Texas. And because we'd all grown up with Dallas, 
my friends were like, you cannot go, you cannot go. Everybody was terribly worried <laughs> that somebody drinking whiskey was going to stab me or something. And long after I went, they were like, so are you living in a ranch? I'm like, no. <laughs> How far are you to Dallas? It was, it was a big leap. I was like, what is this place going to look like? <laughs> I, I, I couldn't really make So I ended up at Austin, though. And then one thing led to another. I was doing... Um, I was doing sort of, I did a master's and then I, there was a PhD program in the thing. Before I knew it, I had applied to it. And before I knew it, they were paying me to be a grad student, which basically meant I was TAing. And it was poverty wages, to be honest, but it was amazing. There was like open shelf libraries. And like, if they didn't kick me out, I think I'd be just, <laughs> I don't want to graduate. I'd just be very happy taking classes for the rest of my life, but all good things must come to an end. Uh, and at the time, and this is the, the Zapatista movement, had, it was sort of, it was kind of winding down in terms of attention, but it was a movement that people were talking about uh, on how much it had been affected by the internet. It had, they had gotten a lot of solidarity. This was a peasant uprising in southern Mexico. And I was really curious, you know, what is this movement that's using internet and all of that? Because part of my motivation was, how do we change the world and how do we do things with social movements and the internet? Because I thought we're going to bust open censorship with this, because I grew up under censorship. So what happened is I ended up traveling to Chiapas, where this movement was. I went to the mountains, uh, where the peasants were, they're indigenous people mostly. And it was my first experience of realizing that what we think is going to happen and what actually happens can be quite different, right? So for one thing, if you've ever seen sort of pictures of the Chiapas area, it's gorgeous pictures. Like there's, it's um, forests on uh, mountains. And there's always this sort of very beautiful mist that covers the mountain, sometimes like clouds that cover the mountain. It looks just beautiful. Well, that mist, it's a wet cloud. <laughs> You're just shivering in it. It's pretty from afar and in the picture, it's not at all pretty to be in it. It's kind of like being in a very, very cold sort of fair. And forget the internet, these people didn't have electricity, right? They weren't really using the internet. What had happened, that I figured out was that in 1994, there was the first movement, maybe the 1994 anti-NAFTA movement that had started using email networks to organize, like right, unions and other op opponents. And through a bunch of coincidences, the Zapatistas launched their insurgency the very day NAFTA went into effect. Now, a lot of people think this is strategic brilliance that the Zapatistas then just picked up the organizations that had been defeated but were looking for something to do uh, because one of the problems for the Zapatista movement was that the NAFTA, NAFTA changed the communal ownership of land they had. They were afraid of privatization. In reality, they had tried to start their insurgency a couple months earlier and had bungled it. And they had picked up the, the 31st of um, December because it was a holiday for, you know, they thought it would be easier. But fine, right? Let's think it was strategic brilliance. That was just one of the many things that we kind of projected onto them. And when I went there, one of my earliest memories is how, uh, I mean, oh, there, one of my strongest memories is a young woman who came to me with two kids, like two five-year-old, I mean, one, two, one, five-year-old maybe. And she said, can you take a picture of my kids? Now, on that part of the world, very often they don't want you to take a picture. I mean, it's, they've been colonized for so long, and there's a, certain, a lot of times when I go there, you know, the first thing would be, please don't take a picture. But she was like, please take a picture, and can you make sure to send me that picture or make sure I get it? When I say she said to me, I mean she said it in probably Toholabal, an indigenous Mayan language, and the kid who was the kids were like trilingual, uh, would translate it into Spanish, and it, either my broken Spanish or somebody would translate from Spanish to English, and I would translate to Turkish. Like, that was the communication. So I was like, I'm missing something here. Like, does she really want me to take the picture? I was really suspicious that the seven-layer chain was not communicating properly. 
And finally, you know, I was like, yes, she wants to take the picture. She wants me to take this picture. Why? Her kids were growing up without her having a single record of the kids growing up. She had no photographs, no cameras. Now, can you imagine a part of the world that's like that right now? You know, Afghanistan is at 90% phone penetration. This is within my adult lifetime. I'm not even close to retirement. <laughs> not voluntarily, anyway. <laughs> I mean, this is really rapid. This is a very fast change. I bet you folding money, if I went there, every village would have, almost every household with at least one cell phone, and I don't even have to ask if they would have a camera. Like, the idea of someone asking someone else to document their kids, I mean, those kids, if they survived, uh, I say this because one of the problems was there's a high child mortality rate, but I hope they did. They're basically college age right about now. It's not that long ago. And this has changed very rapidly. So I studied a lot on how social movements and digital technologies interact. Started with the Zapatistas, and I wrote a book about it, which uh, Dan was so kind about, and it's called Twitter and Tear Gas. The tear gas part is as much part of it uh, as the Twitter part. And its subtitle is The Power and Fragility of Network Protest. Because one of my theses there is that using digital technology to scale up fast means that a lot of movements are growing really large quickly using social media. But they're entering their first big tactical turn 100 miles an hour. They just started three months ago, and they haven't built their steering wheel. But all of that is in my book. So I'm not really going to talk about it. <laughs> I'm going to talk about my future work here. I just wanted to sort of have this briefish introduction to what I do and how I think about it to kind of put in place some of the things that come together for me in what I'm thinking about the future. And when I'm thinking about the future part, I have been quite alarmed. Uh, right around 2011 or so. And one of the things that was, so 2010, 2011, and one of the things that was happening there is, of course, the Arab uprisings, the Arab Spring, uh, which, I mean, I studied at, in depth, and it's all in the book. And the, I'm not trying to sell the book. There's a Creative Commons copy. So if you go to my website, you can download it for free legally. Uh, but um, the, the thing is, uh, at the same time as it was being used for these movements of people seeking freedom, dignity, all the things that people have sought in movements for so long. I was also getting really worried about how authoritarians and the powerful would use these tools. And some of the technologies being developed, I was getting really worried about the advertising technology that was undergirding the digital economy and what that meant for a lot of other things. And from the corner of my eye, you started seeing what has turned into this machine learning boom, right? You start seeing these advances in artificial intelligence. I mean, it's kind of funny to think, but some of, some of the seminal papers that really blew our mind in this are like five years old, and it's happened so fast. So I was getting worried. And in 2012, I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times. Um, Sherlock got in uh, at the time. like. They were probably like, I can't pronounce her name, but we'll just let it be. Uh, I got um, sort of this, they wanted to publish someone whose name starts with a Z, maybe. There aren't that many of us. Uh, not female, anyway. There's some male names in English, but not that many female names uh, that start with a Z. So, and in it, I argued that the Obama campaign's success in digital technologies should actually be a warning sign. And I argued that sort of this kind of dark posts in Facebook that nobody else sees, kind of targeting people with massive data on them and uh, privatizing the public sphere so that it's no longer something that all of us can see and interact with. And all the other things. And I said, you know, it's not about the candidate. It's not, I'm not passing judgment on Obama or not. I'm not even begrudging the campaign the desire to win. Right? That's their job, and they're going to try to win. But I was like, we should be able to see all the ads that go dark on Facebook. 
there should be a public repository of whatever a campaign says. If there's political messaging, I mean, you don't have to disclose exactly how many, you know, who you sent it to, maybe protect people's privacy, but I argued for having public depositories of political messaging so that stuff doesn't happen in the dark without us seeing and that we and the sort of we and people should have a sense of what the campaign knows about them and how they're being targeted and all of the things. And at the time, um, I have like 300 columnists, uh, sorry, commenters on the site saying, what's wrong with you? Because <laughs> people thought, Obama won, this is great, what's your problem? And in the academy and in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of people who are liberal or libertarian, and a lot of people who support the Democrats. And they got very, very mad at me. I mean, I got threat. Like my people who put me on panels got threatened that they would never appear on panels with me or appear in their conferences if they ever invited me again. And I'm talking like top Democrats threatening conferences never to invite me. I got written a response basically ridiculing my concerns, saying this is paranoia. And I said, again, it's not about your candidate. All right, somebody has to think about the public sphere and what this could mean. So in 2000, this is 2012. In 2013, I started worrying about a Facebook-fueled ethnic cleansing campaign in Burma. Like a year later, I started publicly saying, are you guys watching this? This is gonna be potentially the first one. I started tweeting about it publicly, and that's also in the news today, and it's part of the thing. And the, the response I got back then was the idea that these tools, we're using them, we're great, they'll always be in our hands. I've had top data scientists, top data scientists from the Obama team, sort of that did all of that, top data scientists from Silicon Valley, who argued with me that they would be in control of all this, it would only empower the good guys, it would never empower anyone else, because they argued that this is sort of science. And the other side, they said, doesn't believe in science, doesn't even believe in climate change or anything. How could they effectively use these tools? And I was like, have you ever read history? <laughs> like, do you know anything about the way the world works? I, you know, the, the idea that you're going to create these tools and they're going to stay in your hands because they're based on science, I, I mean, it was beyond ridiculous. I didn't really know how to even respond to such charges. But they were adamant that it would always stay like that. So I started sort of working on this. And in 2014, I published this paper about computational politics where I outlined all the things that I thought were a danger to the public sphere, this democracy versus clickbait stuff. I wrote the paper, and once again, I had the reaction, and I'm not sort of saying the reaction say, oh, look, I was right. I think that's kind of what we need to be guarded against, is that um, I usually argue that you need to think, like, what could go wrong? Now, being from the Middle East really helps develop that skill. <laughs> <laughs> like, you kind of are constantly like, oh, okay, what could go wrong? You know how you guys, oh, yeah, I've seen this sort of American, like, genuine native born here or came here really young Americans, not people like me who are later transplants. They walk into elevators, even if it's closing, because they trust it's not going to chop their head off. I can't do it. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I'm going to wait for it to close or open. I am not going to walk in front of that because I'm always thinking this isn't going to work. Right? Because you know, I'm from that part of the world. It turns out, actually, it's a helpful impulse to sort of start thinking about this. So what I'm going to do uh, for the rest of my time here is now I'm going to switch to the case. And I have two cases to make here. One of them is that the algorithmic culture and algorithmic public sphere, along with artificial intelligence, poses really novel threats to freedom. And part of my argument is that we're lacking the imagination on how to interpret them. We keep going back to old 20th century metaphors, and I don't think they're right. I don't think we have the correct metaphors. I don't think we have the right fiction. I don't think we have the right movies for it yet. Uh, we're kind of, the very early stuff is starting, but we need a lot more. And the second part is I want to talk about what the uh, ad, um, ad giants, Facebook and Google, and their dominance means for um, the public.
So finally, the slides can start moving. OK. And I want to. Now, in the, I'm just looking for the clicker. So in the 20th century, OK, the uh, pers persuasion architectures, like if you wanted to convince someone, you told them stories. And very often, these were um, done with film. Now, you might think of film as this great art, and it is. But if you look at the history of film, a lot of its innovation and a lot of its craft came from people using it for pretty horrible propaganda. In the United States, it's the birth of a nation, the movie, the racist, horrendous movie that went viral in its day and helped relaunch the KKK. The director also invented a lot of the craft of movie making that we see. There's no rule that says people who are technically talented cannot also be horrible people. In fact, very often it happens to be that way. In Europe, uh, Triumph of the Will, the Muni Olympiad, all of that directed by Leni Riefenstahl. If you watch ESPN right now, you're watching shots she invented. The crane shot, the sort of their stuff on rails. They literally invented the language and craft of movie making to make Hitler look charismatic and or to sort of um, promote violent and vicious form of racism. And it worked. Now if you watch it, you'll roll your eyes. Because we had almost a century of cultural antibodies to that kind of propaganda. We recognize it. It looks crude to us. You see ads, you go, oh my god, you know, you just roll your eyes. It calls the persuasion, manipulative persuasion methods. We've gotten a lot of resistance to it. They don't really work. So my argument here is that the 21st century versions of this are different, and I believe they're working already. So let's sort of go. I'm not going to talk about all of this. These are my headlines. I just put them here. I'm going to go through all of this one by one. So the first thing is that the current digital economy is based on massive surveillance that would make Orwell literally blush probably. Right? That's why I don't even think those are good models. The amount of data that is collected on all of us as part of the digital economy is massive. And five years ago, I used to have to explain this a lot more. I think right now I can just sort of say it and move on. Right? Um, and I don't think we can meaningfully consent to this data collection. I don't think the consent model works because it is really hard for people who are technical and in the weeds of it to predict what this data will enable in five years. How can I consent to something that is so unpredictable? I don't think informed consent is working at all in terms of privacy. So the other thing that we're doing is the digital technologies have given us the opportunity to experiment at scale. Right? In the past, we couldn't really experiment at scale. You know, you can experiment at labs, they have all sorts of shortcomings. You can do natural experiments when something occurs luckily or unluckily. You know, you have a disaster or something, you do pre-post, you have, you know, sort of various discontinuous regression designs. You have stuff you can kind of do. It's pretty limited and depends on your luck. With digital world, everything is being constantly tested. Every platform, everybody is giving you this, giving you that, testing this, testing that. Well, they call it in the industry, they say A-B testing. I mean, it's literally the scientific method, right? You have a control group, you randomize, you change things, you look. So, like in the past, if you wanted to tell a story, you had Don Draper of Mad Men. I don't know if you watched it, but this is a sort of a ma uh, ad executive from the 60s. And here, he's kind of burnt out in long, many, many seasons of Emmy-winning TV show. And he's burnt out, and he goes to the sort of meditation hippie commune. And while everybody's thinking of world peace, he's thinking of a Coca-Cola ad, right? Genius strikes him, and he's got the Coca-Cola ad. That was kind of the model. It, it, this is not the actual model going forward. It literally looks like the kind of crude charts we show undergrads on the scientific method or high schoolers. But it's really like that. Read papers, conduct experiments, do this, do this, show this, show that, experiment. Infer private attributes, which I'll talk about, which is a new thing. Uh, experiment more, iterate. This is how the digital economy is working. They're surveilling you, they're testing on things on you, and you don't even see this. 
So, um, and this is sort of the technical teeny little thing, is that right now, a lot of what we're using is machine learning, another subfield, sub, like a related form, deep learning sometimes it's called. Basically, the thing that's important here is that if you're programming computers, there's two general ways you can go about it. One is the Marvin Minsky school, as I call it. Well, I don't know if maybe a lot of people call it, where you just give instructions. You say, do this, do this, do this, do this. You give this painstakingly detailed instructions. Okay? You, you're analytic. You're explaining it to the computer step by step by step by step in tedious detail. It still creates complexity and emergence, you know, because you have a lot of these things interacting with each other, but every instruction has been written by someone. And you can go back and look and say, oh, did this, did this, did this, and you can kind of debug it. That's one way of programming. That is not what we do anymore. That's like the thing that's driving the industry right now is basically algorithms that have learned to learn. What you do is you feed it this big data. That's why the digital economy's surveillance model is significant. You feed it all this data, right? And then it turns through this data. And we were just speaking before the thing, it's linear algebra. Who would have thought the dot product would be in the middle of transforming history, but here we are, all right? And then it's these creating these giant matrices and multiplying them and whatever. And then building layer upon layer of networks, neural networks with weights. And then doing something called gradient descent, doesn't really matter. The point is you no longer have any clue what this learning system is doing. What it does, it learns to classify things. But it can say these people are going to be you know, more productive workers, and these people are less likely to be more productive workers. right? It can classify, say, applicants into more productive, less productive. You have no idea how it's doing that any more than you would know what I was saying right now if you happen to be shown a cross section of my brain. Like you could have, even if somebody had shown you everything in my brain, the whole physical mess, you wouldn't really figure out what I was saying from that. We don't have that kind of understanding. We also don't have that understanding, right? We can, we're, we're not really programming them, we're growing them. And it's a form of intelligence and a lot of people kind of worry about, they think, the sort of humanoid stuff. And I'm like, no, this is what's happening. And these methods, they kind of go back to ideas in the 50s. And people had dismissed them, saying it wouldn't work. Apparently, it needed all the data to turn through. And the people who thought this method is the, it's kind of inspired by the brain. It's not exactly like the brain. So it's called neural network. But it works to a striking degree compared to other methods. It's not always right, but it's right enough to be really attractive. It can be deployed at scale. And it's really messy because we don't really understand it. We don't understand this error pattern. It makes mistakes. We don't understand uh, the pattern. When it classifies people like, say, high productive to workers versus low productive to workers, potentially, we know that it's got some false positive and false negative rates. We don't know exactly what they are. And even if we can cumulatively sort of postdoc calculate, which has its own complications, case by case, we don't really understand. We don't know what it picked up. And every company that I know, that I've ever talked to, and if you look at the investments, everybody's investing heavily in this because this is powerful. And this is, uh, it's got a lot more complications, but this is also being used in the public sphere. So this is a paper that just came out. And they're using these techniques to identify protesters, even if their faces are covered. Now, you can usually do this anyway if you're eyeballing someone, and if you can look at all the pictures and you know. But with this, you can do this at scale. right? It's automated. The machine can do it. And when I sort of tweeted about this, people were like, oh, we'll just wear better masks. And I'm like, the other paper can identify you from your walk. right? 
things that people can't do. I cannot. Like there's a couple of people who are close friends of mine. I can probably identify their distinct walk if they have one. But you can do this at scale. And you don't even have to do a lot. And a lot of this tech is off the shelf. This is not getting more complicated. There's an older paper, they used dating site profiles. They were able to identify people's sexual orientation from dating site profiles pretty well. This was a proof of concept study. They didn't use advanced stuff on purpose. They pulled off the shelf stuff to show that an authoritarian regime could easily do this. Now, they're not gonna be right all the time. And this is not an argument that sexual orientation is embedded in your face in some biological way. It could be some cultural thing. It could be the way people comb their hair, right? So there's a lot of things it could be picking up on. But it's picking up on something. And worse, we don't even know what it's picking up on. Um, recently, Facebook, according to Australian newspapers, told uh, ad executives that it can identify when teenagers are what are the words? Uh, if they feel insecure, worthless, or they need a confidence boost. So you could target teenagers who are feeling insecure. Now, this isn't happening with Facebook doing a string search for the word, I feel insecure. Okay, that's not what's happening. It's inferring it computationally from who knows what. They don't know either. I have a friend who churned through data she can predict pretty well people's propensity to go into clinical depression before the onset of symptoms from social media data. I can imagine a machine learning system that uses it to weed out applicants. Now she's thinking postpartum depression intervention. I'm thinking they're gonna use this kind of stuff to not hire people. And you won't even know you're doing this, right? You, your black box isn't gonna tell you. Just Facebook likes, only Facebook likes, which are like a rounding error on the kind of data Facebook has on you. Just Facebook likes that were voluntarily turned over. People could use that to identify ethnicity, religious and political views, intelligence, happiness, use of drugs, parental separation, pretty well. Are you a Democrat or Republican? I think 80, 90% accuracy. Just your Facebook likes. It can identify, once again, your Politi political view or your sexual orientation or your drug use, even if you've never ever disclosed it on the site. I mean, at the point, we're at the point that these algorithms could pretty easily identify stuff like that, kind of about you, even if you're not on Facebook, by kind of figuring out your network location because your friends are on Facebook and they upload their phone books, your phone number is there, so they can figure out which friend network you're in and they can infer and probably do a pretty good job. So, why is this important? Like in, the, I don't know, have you guys seen these sort of checkout things, uh, by the counter, candy, by kid's eye level? That's a persuasion architecture. The way it works is that just as you're trying to check out, the supermarket is hoping that your kid will start whining for that Snickers bar. And you're kind of in a hurry and you're like, here you go. And it's not nice, but it kind of works, right? But it only works if you have a little human with you that's gonna whine for it. You can only place a few things there, and it's visible to everyone. And it's clear that it's out to manipulate you. What happens when these algorithms, and they're already kind of doing it, figure out your vulnerabilities and weaknesses, and start targeting you one by one, screen by screen? So you don't even know it's a persuasion architecture, and you don't even know what your neighbor is seeing. So the panopticon is a 20th century sort of scared thing where this is, comes from uh, Jeremy Bentham as a reformist and he imagined this prison where there would be one guard tower and the guard tower would shine the light and you'd never know if you were being watched. I think this is a totally wrong model. It keeps getting, it comes up. This is the limit of our imagination because that's not how the new ones work. That one, the light shone and you got pissed off, but you were kind of scared. That one is, works on fear. The current one, this is a Facebook experiment published in Nature, huge experiment, because Facebook experiments get done on 61 million people. This was done on 61 million people. One group saw the thing that's on your left, which had the little tiny thumbnails of their friends who had voted, and another group saw the one on the right that just said, you know, today's election day. See the difference? That's the tiny little difference. 
This message was shown randomly to the control group and non-control group once. It turned out, at a minimum, an extra 340,000 people in 2010. And they disclosed this after the fact because Facebook still has data scientists who want to publish stuff, and they were allowed kind of back then. You'd never know about it. Facebook turned out 340,000 people, and if they hadn't disclosed it, you'd have no idea. Um, I was going to show this one. Uh, there's one more. Did they, I, I don't have the slide, but they replicated this. They did the same thing in 2012 and turned out an additional 270,000 people with a single message. Once again, if they didn't disclose it, you'd never know about it. Uh, for reference, the US 2016 election was decided by 100,000 votes. So with a single nudge, Facebook was able to turn out at least three times the number of people that decided the 2016 election. And this has already happened, right? So this is what I want to show you guys. In the um, Trump campaign, they openly said this. They targeted, through Facebook, of what they called a voter suppression operation to African-American men and young women and groups like Haitians. And for example, to African-American men, they tried to discourage them from voting at all. It wasn't a persuasion operation. It was just to say, democracy doesn't work, don't do anything, don't vote. And they did it specifically, as the quote says, through Facebook, because they call them dark posts, because you didn't know that was going on. Nobody but them and Facebook knew this was going on. You don't get to counter it. I mean, dirty tactics in elections are as old as elections, probably. But this is different because it can be targeted very well. You can figure out exactly who's vulnerable to it. You can use algorithms to find people who are vulnerable to it. And Facebook will use AI to give you look-alike audiences. We'll find you more people like it very nicely. It's just sort of drop-down menus. A few hundred dollars, you can do this. This isn't even expensive. And you can bombard them with messages that are aimed to discourage them from voting. And nobody can know about it. I was able to confirm these messages exist. I found people who are targeted like this. How widespread? We don't know. Facebook won't tell us. What happened? We don't know. African-American male turnout is way down. Why? We don't know. But this is one of the dynamics. Um, so non-public post was viewership, the campaign controls. I'm just quoting their campaign manager. right? I'm not making this up. So uh, this is what I just said. And I'm going to finish up with the clickbait part, because that plays into it. Um, so the things here are measurement is destiny. I'm going to show you all four, and then I will show you one by one. What people want, the problem of scale, and institutions and human civilization. And we're going to wrap up with this. So what you measure is destiny. This is sort of a joke from the Soviet era. So if you're central planning and you're like, OK, we would like five tons of nail produced this year, this is what you get. Right? And then if you say, no, no, we want 5,000 nails, you get tiny little pins. It's like whatever you measure, people play up to it. And right now, the whole ecology of the digital economy is geared towards making people click right there and right then, or to nudge them to buy stuff. So they're building this persuasion architecture just for the ads. And they always say what people want. We're just giving people what people want. And I, sh I, I liken it to. The shift in the food ecology we live through, you know, this is, we used to forage in the savanna. Looks cool, but it's not easy. And now we've got this, right? I can't even pick up ketchup without having to sort of read 17 labels. I just want ketchup, and there's so many options. Now, in such an environment where your biology, your evolution is completely geared towards eating sugar, salt, and fat whenever you can, because it made perfect sense, right? Because if your ancestors were always into dieting, that wasn't going to really work well for them. You didn't have the option. You found food, you ate it. You didn't have fridges. So we now, for the first time this year, we have more children for whom obesity is a problem than children for whom hunger is a problem. 2017 is the turning point. And for all human history, it was hunger that was the problem. For once, we have this. So we have to deal with this. Now, what people want is a big question, what people want when. Like if you serve people sugar, salt, and fat every meal, 
because that's what people want. Well, people will pick it up. But what people want in their deathbed is probably different than what people want then. What people want when they're hungry is a different thing than when they're not. And what people want if you sit with them and ask them versus just put sugar, salt, and fat in the cafeteria all the time is different. But this is what they're measuring, so the whole thing is geared towards that. And so I'm going to close with two slides. Slide one, Facebook decided to experiment out of the blue in six countries where it separated pages, like New York Times has a page. It's not your friend, not your sort of thing. It's an institution. They separated pages into a separate feed, and then they put the friend posts into the regular feed. So they basically buried pages, say like New York Times, in six countries, Cambodia, Guatemala, Sri Lanka, Serbia, Slovenia, Bolivia. Immediately, as soon as you change the structure, this is really like the cafeteria. If you put sugar, salt, and fat and nothing else in front of people first, that's what happens. If you change the options, it changes. Immediately, these news organizations saw their reach drop by 60-80%. They just did this. How did they pick these six countries? I'm guessing somebody looked at the numbers and similar sized countries in different parts of the world. I'm looking at this, I'm like, two genocides, one civil war, one ethnic cleansing, I'm not kidding, and World War I. Like, I mean, who the heck picks these to experiment on? Like, if you're gonna mess with the information ecology of six countries in the world, how do you come up with this? How devoid of any historian or anybody who's read anything in the past 30 years? do you have to come up with this list? That just kind of shows you the problem of scale. If you've got a giant two billion thing, you're like, all right, let's experiment. And this is the last thing, and sorry to be a downer. I'm really a cheery person. Please don't like, blow you. I'm not, and if you come to the dinner, I'm not gonna sort of uh, be this horrible storyteller, but let's end on this sort of really scary thing because this is something that's really important to me. A uh, couple, in 2000, so basically Burma, which had this military dictatorship, Myanmar, right, when uh, they had this Aung San Suu Kyi, who is this Nobel laureate, the world was really happy that there was peace in Burma, and she seemed like this amazing person, very long story, the place was, it's small enough, it was flooded with digital technology. SIM cards, like they went from, $100 like to $2, the, everybody has phones. And very, but the place has no institutions. It came from years and years, decades of military dictatorship, doesn't have news, doesn't have civil society, doesn't have this, doesn't have that. And as early as 2011, 10, people started seeing hate speech, ethnic cleansing inciting hate speech, go viral on Facebook. Now, I'm not an, I, I've always had a soft spot for the country because the story is so touching and military dictatorships kind of feel familiar to me. Uh, but people started telling me about this as early as 2012, I believe. And in 2013, I publicly started speculating if this country would be the first Facebook field ethnic cleansing campaign. We went to Facebook. People talked to them as much as they could and said, are you paying attention to this? But what can you do, right? You write about it, you tweet. And to show you, like to prove to you that any religion can have its extremists, it's extremist Buddhist monks. It's kind of like, like hard to imagine, but that's what it is. And they have all these campaigns that are portraying the Rohingya, who are those peasant people, as, I mean, literally the way Jews were portrayed in Nazi Germany. If you read the post, it's fairly similar. It's the whole information ecology is Facebook and to some degree WhatsApp more recently. And this has been happening for years. Facebook kind of started cracking down some stuff, but it's still all over the place. And as you can see, there's a couple articles. This is from today. This is today's New York Times. It's the second biggest refugee crisis in the world for years now. People don't notice it because it's not serious. It's not sending people to Europe, so we care less. Uh, but it's been the second biggest refugee crisis for years. It was connected to Facebook's uh, effect there. Obviously, it's not just Facebook, but this is what happens when you mass drop connectivity to a volatile place with no other institutions and no proper oversight. Like, it's not just like you connect people, it works out. There's a lot of institutions that go into making civilization work. 
Um, and this is a very sort of interest to quote is that I have to thank Facebook because it is giving me true information in Myanmar about this is a person who's never met a Muslim person and believes the Rohingya who are Muslim are killing babies. I mean, it's just blood libel stuff. It's exactly that. And right now it's reached this huge crisis and they're going into Bangladesh and Bangladesh is a poor country. Like this isn't, this is going to destabilize just the way Syria destabilized both Europe and Middle East. This is likely going to destabilize the whole region. And this is the kind of stuff that can happen. So um, this is the, the, the US election. This is why I don't talk about it much is that I think the US election, everyone's kind of alarmed and they should be. But I want to say that US is one of the places the effects have been least worst. This is why I'm, like, I've written tons about the US election. I wrote about the misinformation campaign on Facebook before the election. I wrote about all of those things because it was visible. You could eyeball it. You could literally see it. I interviewed fake news producers and I did all of that. But I've sort of stopped talking as much about the US because Facebook is here. It's facing a lot of pressure. And this is where it's acting as well as it does. So you can imagine what's happening in the rest of the world, where they have like one person overlooking a country or something like that. And this is really worrying me, partly because I think the US election stuff is very real um, and a lot to say, and you can find my writings about it, but this is like the best case scenario. There are Americans working there who care about this, and there's American legislators who have power over them, and they're kind of upset, so they're trying to do something but this is the only place they care. And we're, what we're gonna face next is not just fake news, but AI can produce fake video. So this is gonna be really fun when that happens. So I'm gonna sort of leave it there uh, <laughs> with surveillance authoritarianism. I just wanna say think Huxley, not really Orwell. And I don't, I wanna sort of go into the Q&A and not think, oh yeah, this is my final thing. I don't wanna fear this uh, or this as much as this. <laughs> this is sort of the virtual reality thing where people are there. And I think going forward, we really have to expand our imagination. We have to make the hidden visible. We need to stop building the surveillance authoritarianism just to sell people's shoes. Like, this is why we're doing it. The, the Western version of this is crazy. We're doing this for the ad economy. And it's still early. We don't have to do this. Like, let's just not go down this road and let's sort of expand our imagination. That's why I think the academy is really important because right now Silicon Valley's got either dollar signs in their eyes, like the cartoons, or they're just, they're way in over their heads. All right, so we need to figure out how do we do this differently. Thank you. All right. Okay. Am I? Oh, so. Test, test. Test, test. So obviously, when I went to library school, I learned the old-fashioned kind of programming, right? So my question is, the example you gave about um, analyzing data and decide and coming up with the uh, more productive and less productive. I mean, doesn't does somebody somebody have to ask the question? Okay, so you have to ask the question, and you have to decide what you're optimizing for, like productivity. But you don't tell it what parameters correlate with productivity. For example, you don't tell it anything. Um, an example I give is, let's say you want to sell tickets to Vegas, all right? You have discount plane tickets and you're like, who do I target this to? And your AI says, these people are more likely to buy it and these people are less likely to buy it. And all you know is that you trained it on some existing ticket buyers before and you're just telling it basically find more people like this. But how are these people like those people? You have no idea. It's just learned to classify them. So for all you know, it is, um, for all you know, it's targeting people who are prone to manic episodes. And I'm not kidding. And they're on sort of the early stages of a manic upswing. And I know for a fact that it's not even hard for machine learning to predict the 
early stages of a manic upswing before any symptoms. So you could be doing that. And people who are in a manic phase tend to become compulsive gamblers and overspenders. And they might be more vulnerable to buying that uh, plane ticket. And all you see is my plane tickets are being sold. You have no idea. And there is, at the moment, no feasible way to reverse engineer this. There is no variable there that says manic phase. There's nothing like that. Like this is an Im this, I'm just imagining that this might be something it's picking up on. It's a very plausible scenario. But it's this giant me you know, matrix of weights. And you, there's no variables. There's nothing. There's not a single, like if you did old-fashioned programming, you'd write a variable saying, like if you were going to sell tickets to Vegas, you'd be like, has credit card, with high limits, likes to travel, is retired, like you'd put some parameters in. There's not a single parameter in this giant matrix. Right? It's just a bunch of weights, and you're kind of, it's doing what it's doing. It works to a degree, and all you see is your sales going up, but who knows what it's picking up on? It's black box. Now, this is like why you need a research program. You need to, I mean, it's too long what I think we could do, but there are real sort of issues with, like you can't just tell people transparency. Right now, a lot of the examples seem to want transparency. The people could give you the code, they could give you the whole data, and you would not know. It, it's, it's that, that's why this is such a big deal, is that it works to a great degree. Plus, it's sometimes getting it wrong, right? These are not sort of 100% correct things, but the way they get it wrong isn't the way humans get it wrong. And our cultural institutions, our cultural antibodies, they're all geared towards human error patterns. And we're not really used to dealing with the machine intelligence error pattern, not this kind of machine intelligence. So here we are. Yes. I wanted to sort of follow up on that question. You, you almost make it sound like you start the program going and really have no idea where it's going to end up. You can't debug it, decode it. And so my question is, if you had two identical machines and you started them on the same path, yes. would they end <laughs> up they in converge? the same place? Well, OK, so <laughs> interesting question, because there's a recent paper, still at the archive stage, that they are susceptible to a lot of parameterization early on. And in fact, making them work is still health craft, health this. And they kind of do, but they sometimes don't. So what will happen is they will all converge on something, but person by person, they won't spit out the same answer, right? So they all do work. And let's say they all get around, say, 70 to 85% correct. But they're sensitive enough to the way they're tweaked is that they may classify a person very differently. But statistically speaking, they, they will have broad outlines. So that's another thing. For example, they're being used in sentencing. Right? How do you use something like this in sentencing? Now, on the other hand, I want to be clear. It's not like human sentencing is all great and unbiased. Right? I mean, right now, there is a paper out that shows that judges whose alma mater college football team suffers from an unexpected loss. If you expect it, it doesn't happen. But if you have an unexpected loss, the Monday after, they are harsher on black defendants. <laughs> I mean, they're in a bad mood. And why exactly are they doing it? Are they associating black men, mostly men, with college athletes? Because a lot of college athletes are black men. Are they just punishing the most vulnerable? Because that's what people do. It's kind of a black box to us, too. And if you ask the judges, they'd have no clue they're doing this. Like when you just do the numerical stuff, you find this. So it's not like, like I, so I'm sympathetic to the argument that these might be black boxes, but so are humans and not always great. But the thing to acknowledge is that their pattern, they're, they're not like less smart humans. That's the thing for me, is that everybody's thinking about chess or, I'm like, why are we thinking about chess? Chess is a game because it's kind of alien to human kind of thinking, right? I mean, to me, it's not really an interesting benchmark. It's like testing the computer with chess is like testing the cheetah with running. 
Like, why are we doing this? It's not, like we play it as a game because it's not natural to us. You have to kind of force yourself to do it. So, and then when it beats us at chess, we're like, oh, are they smarter? And I'm like, they're really, like smarter, not smart, is not the correct way, in my view, to approach this new kind of intelligence because it's not a less smart human, it's not a smarter than human thing either, it's a different sort of spectrum. And I think the question we really face is what is the spectrum? Right? What is the error pattern? Like, what do they get wrong? Do they converge? Do they do this? Uh, how do we deal with its own statistical thing? And if we're going to empower it to do very important um, gatekeeping, like hiring people to their first job, I lied my way through my first job. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, I talked about the broken, desperate part, right? Uh, so I really desperately needed a job because I was basically homeless and 16. So that's not a great place to be in uh, Istanbul. And my first job, they were like, can you program in C? I said, okay. <laughs> There's this great book called Kernig and Ritchie, C, like everybody who does it know. And my school's library had it. So my interview was the next day. I literally sat up all night and read the book because I didn't have a C compiler or anything. I just read the book. And I lied my way through the interview. Obviously, I was like, oh, okay, all right, here's a print something, right? I, and I, you know, it was early enough that they just hired me anyway because early enough. And that job was so important to me because I thought I'm going to get fired in a month, but they'll give me one month salary. And if you're a homeless girl in Istanbul, that one month salary is a lot of money. I thought I'll just get one month out of them, right? And I hid under desks for a month, like learning and stuff like that, and I didn't get fired. And that led to everything else. Right? That led to me kind of stabilizing, I could rent a place, I could sue, and blah, blah, the rest is great history. I even met the guy who wrote the book, and I told him the story, and it was like, this is crazy. I'm like, yeah, thank you <laughs> for being a great writer. Um, so, Ryan Kernigan. So, the thing, though, is a better system would have caught me out. Like, there is benefits to error in an efficiency. Right? It's not always great, but there's benefits to it, to being able to, like I'm not advocating let's hire liars, but you know what? History is not that determined. Like you give a people a chance. So if you're judging them with these algorithms, you're judging them on their past, right? Because that's all the data the thing can chew through. It's gonna judge them through the past. So if you looked at my past, it would have been like, not a C programmer, bye, right? And it would have been correct. So, that's the other thing, like, do we really want to be, even if they're more accurate, what are the downsides of being more accurate? I mean, my life would have been horrible if I wasn't convincing liar, or, or, or maybe the person understood and they were polite, I don't know, and compassionate, yes? Where do we start? <laughs> so, is it a good, here first, in the microphone, please. Is it a good first step for transparency to have a record of who pays for what on Facebook? Absolutely. I mean, I've been asking for that for a long, long time. But the thing is, even though I've been asking for that for a long, long time, the thing is, the pay part is tiny bit. The organic virality is the big thing. And that's because Facebook's algorithm is sugar, salt, salt and fat friendly, right? If every, something is hitting the outrage button, or the cute button, like we tend to go. That's why your Facebook feed is either people fighting or baby pictures. Like you see a baby picture, you click on like, and algorithm's like, oh, more baby pictures, and more. And then like, I'm like, no, <laughs> please. Is there like, I want a filter that just clicks on all the babies and doesn't show them to me. Uh, I mean, nothing against babies, but the thing is you kind of do that. And also there are experiments, if there's a crowd like this, and if one person was sort of growling, really unhappy, I'm more likely to notice them because anger is an important signal, right? I want to know where the threat is. So anger, stuff that induces anger, it's, it's a form of arousal, it's very biological, and you click, you get mad, you fight, like online stuff that happens all the time. It's also slightly depersonalized. So Facebook's algorithm has figured all this out. So I'm not as much, I'm, I'm glad, let's show who pays for what, that's good. Like to give you one more example, YouTube. If you go on YouTube and watch a Donald Trump rally, which I did because I was studying the movement and I was attending his rallies, it starts showing you white supremacist stuff in the recommendation, right? Now you're gonna say, oh, the right in the US, blah, blah, blah. Well, if you watch Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders, it starts showing you um, left conspiracies, 
You're like, oh, this is just politics. Pol political people are into conspiracies. If you start watching vegetarianism, like a video on vegetarianism, YouTube's recommendations are like, would you like to watch a video about being vegan? <laughs> You're never hardcore enough for YouTube. It's constantly <laughs> recommending stuff, right? So what's going on here? This is why the ads are less important, the algorithm's more important. What's going on there is that it's figured out that pushing you to the edge, here's the red pill. Would you like a hardcore version? It's engaging. You're like, oh, there's something more hardcore. And you watch video after video while they serve you ad after ad. They figured like, the ad, they're not programming this on purpose, but it's an extreme, it's a radicalization machine. It's like that friend of yours in college, you listen to rock, they listen to heavy metal, you listen to heavy metal, they listen to death metal, you listen to death metal, they listen to trash metal, they're always out edging you, right? YouTube is constantly trying to make you do this completely algorithmically. To me, that is a huge concern compared to the paid part of it because that's organic. And on Facebook, you're seeing it from your peers and social network, and there's nothing more powerful in shaping of human psychology and society than socialization. TV ads don't work, they're not socialization. But this kind of encouraging, hardcoring yourself, which is very attractive obviously to people, for a bunch of reasons, and I can go on and on in in-group and out-group and social psychology, right? We understand why this works. But the algorithms figured us out. And the thing I keep worrying about is that everybody, there's a lot of talk about what happens if the AI goes you know, Emma can kind of goes autonomous. I'm like, I'm more worried what the powerful will do with the AI than what the AI will somehow do on its own because we're, nobody's growing humanoid anything. That's like, to me, fine, you know, there's some concerns that I think make sense in some sense, but autonomous AI exterminating us is nowhere near the horizon or the agenda or being funded or being developed. Unless killer robots get into a war, but okay. Uh, <laughs> that's still not Skynet. But AI being used by the powerful to manipulate us, control us, nudge us, surveil us, that's here. Like, I'm like, let's stop the Terminator talk, except outside of killer robots, which I think is a genuine concern. But let's start talking about what the authoritarians will do with it, rather than what the AI will somehow sort of escape like it's a lab rat or something. That's not what it is. All right, back there. So I, uh, this was a, your last remarks were a, a nice uh, segue because so far it had all been about um, selling shoes. And um, I wonder, I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, the Gezi movement looked like the liberatory power of uh, yeah. you know, uh, the media. And uh, sort of it doesn't seem to have worked out that way. And I'm wondering if the state or the deep state or whatever uh, is using these same uh, techniques because their first reaction seems to be anti-technology, right? Ban Facebook, ban yeah, that's Twitter. That's the zone. old style. That doesn't really work, yeah. Right. So the, the question is, are there states where this is being, um, the, the stuff that you presented is being utilized for some particular purpose? That's a great question. This is, I genuinely mean this. I think there are two institutions in the world who really understand how the digital economy works. One is BuzzFeed, the other is the Chinese Communist Party. I mean this, this is not a joke. Uh, I was watching them like during the Hong Kong movement and it was as if I was their evil advisor. <laughs> they like did everything I thought I'd do to smother a movement. It was just pretty amazing, wait it out, don't give visuals, pull back the police, all of this. Um, there's a great paper by Gary King and Jennifer Penn that looked at what does China censor, right? It's actually a very good question. We know that they have a giant 50 cent army, so-called people are paid for pose. We know they have a censorship machine, but we were like, what do they really censor? We don't know. So here's what they do. Uh, just look up Gary King's website and he has all the papers there. They're great papers. They downloaded all the posts that were going, like they scraped a lot of Chinese social networks time slice by time slice, so you could see what disappeared. They also managed, through some ingenious methods not to go into, to interview the alleged troll armies. Good number of them. So here's what they do. They don't um, censor criticisms of the party as much, partly because they want to know. 
right? If you're China, your problem is you don't have elections, so you don't have signals to figure out what went wrong. In the sort of earlier dynasties, they had petition to the emperor. And when intermediaries tried to block petitioners from getting to the emperor, emperor was like, if I don't know what people are angry about, they're going to come with pitchforks. Right? So they don't censor criticisms of the party. They censor all the criticisms of the censors because censors are apparently very thin-skinned. <laughs> I don't think that's a directive. I think they're just very thin-skinned. But instead of censoring uh, criticisms, they censor anything that might lead to collective action. So that's their sensitive spot. But more interestingly, when there is, let's say there's a political thing happening here that's important. The trolls, the 50 cent army, whatever you want to call them, don't go there and argue with people, right? They go over here and they create a spectacle. Look at me here, right? Not there. So the most, like, this is Herbert Simon saying the most crucial. Like just the way when you have too much food, you figure out how to eat healthy and exercise when you have a desk job, like I have a treadmill desk. Somebody from the 18th century would probably just die from laughter. Where does this go? Nowhere. Does it generate power? No. <laughs> You're on it voluntarily. Why? <laughs> like so that I get some. I, OK, it's crazy, but this is what you have to do. In a world of information glut, verification, authentication, and attention are the crucial things. And the new censorship is distraction and information glut. That's the new censorship. And I don't think a place knows this better than China. Uh, it, some people sort of instinctually have this. If you're a reality TV star, apparently you understand this instinctually. But seriously, this is very important. This is an important skill. And uh, part of the thing is they also are already using AI to uh, facial recognition to arrest people in China. And they're also creating these um, social scores. They're going to use AI to figure out whether you're credit worthy. I will bet you large amounts of folding money, they're going to use this to identify potential dissidents and this and that, unrest, this and because we know this can be done. Right? They're already there. So they're manipulating both the attention. And a lot of people think Chinese Communist Party is crude and behind, and they think Chinese technology is behind. It is not. Facebook is constantly copying WeChat, right? Like they can't, it's very innovative in many ways. You can do more with your phone there than you can do here. Like there's a very advanced digital technology and this AI works with a lot of data. And what we have some little protection at least there, they don't even have it, right? There's an enormous amount of data being collected. So I think the place to watch is that model. And there's also the Russian model, which is more disinformation through information glut and distraction. And that's also spreading. So to me, the current anti-censorship technology I'd like to see more of is not circumvention. It's authentication, verification, attention focusing, because that's where it's at. All right, actually, it's, it's called, um, I, I, I don't want to prize it as patient or- I, I'm patient, patient but it's, sorry, it's, I talk but, a lot. <laughs> but I, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the last question, because I posted. <laughs> <laughs> so you get so you get to sit down with Mark Zuckerberg and, you, and he gives you he grants you two Facebook okay. wishes. Um, so I would like the first wish is that, and I even wrote this. I would like the Facebook to. I would like to be the customer. I think all these ills are stemming from the model where it's our attention and persuasion that's being sold. And I did all the calculations. I read their SEC filings. I know how much they're making. They're not making that much per person. When I wrote this article maybe a year and a half ago, it was like $10, $20 per year per person. Like charge me that $10 and make me the customer. I have written about how great Facebook has been for certain things, right? I have lots of friends who work there. They're not some evil masterminds trying to create ethnic cleansing in you know, places. So, but. As long as we have a digital economy that's based on us being the product to be persuaded, there's no way to mitigate this. Like they keep trying to, because there are a lot of good people there, they keep trying to mitigate this and that, but it's all rounding error. Their business model constantly goes this way. And at the moment, they're under the illusion that um, this will be under their control. And if something bad blows up, they'll just sort of stuff it back into the, I'm like, no. Like that, it's not always going to be under your control. 
You're not always going to be able to stuff the spec. And at some point, Zuck is going to retire and it'll be just one more company. And then it'll, it'll, it won't even have the current breaks it has because they do try to put some breaks on some of the horrible stuff because they're printing money. <laughs> that kind of helps. Maybe they'll, you know, they won't be printing money and then they'll really turn. So that's my wish number one is to have um, a Facebook. And I think it's feasible and I think we can have cross subsidies so that people in India they don't make a lot of money from people in India. They can, the amount of money needed for this, if you don't have the ad technology to develop and all the data scientists to sort of um, pay to better target and persuade. So I would, like to be, I would like the digital economy to make me the customer. And the second thing I would like is this question of constantly tempting people to click right there. I think that's really unhealthy. I would like to have a Facebook quiz that says, what's important to you? And I would like it to give me healthy options. Like, I don't want Facebook to become the Ministry of Truth, right? The reason misinformation is so appealing is that our politics is broken in ways I'm not gonna go into in my last 30 seconds, right? So there's a reality here that needs to be fixed. But I would like Facebook to give people a chance to be their better selves, right? And have the option to say, show me more verified news. Right? The algorithm right now, there's no way for me to communicate to Facebook. I would like more reputable news. I would like you to show me this thing. Here are the fact checks. Like I want, to, I want it to give me some algorithmic options. If I'm feeling kind of bad, it should give me other algorithmic options to show me cheer. Like the algorithms can do all of this, right? So I want to, if once I'm the customer, Right now, it does it for the advertisers. It's like, who would you like to target? And it, you know, would you like a lookalike audience? And blah, blah, blah. Like, it's developing all this technology to serve its true customers. I would like to be its customer. And I would like technology to help me make better choices. I don't want it to force me. I don't want it to censor people, right? Because that goes into places that I don't think are healthy either. So those are the two things that I would ask for Zuck. And in terms of what I would ask from non-Zuck people, I would like to find a way to have real market competition. Because at the moment, there's so many things you just have to be on Facebook for. And they're not going to voluntarily give that up. So how do we find a way so that they're actual alternatives? So those are my, it, it's three, but two are from Zuck, and one is just general wish. <laughs> well, Jean is, thank you.